Welcome to a special bonus edition of the Jesus Calling Podcast, featuring multiple guests who have appeared in their own episodes on the Jesus Calling Podcast, speaking to how they deal with doubt and fear in their lives. Doubt is a normal part of our experience as humans. When something doesn't line up with the facts as we know them, or when something unforeseen wrecks carefully laid plans, we might find ourselves wondering if God's promises really are true. Many of the stories you'll hear in this episode are from those who face doubt and the fear that comes from not knowing if what you believe is true, and what happened when they took those doubts to God. We'll start with a thought from Pastor Craig Greshel. You know, when I was growing up, if you had any kind of faith doubts around the Christian community, you often felt like a lesser Christian, like you were failing in some way. And so I kind of always had the idea that I had to either deny my doubts or suppress my doubts. The longer I've walked with God, the more I realized that sometimes sincere doubts, they're not a weakness, they'll actually lead to more intimate faith with God. I used to think, you know, God would be disappointed with me for my doubts, but now when I look in scripture, especially in the Old Testament, there, there's an entire book of the Bible, Lamentations, about lamenting to God. David cried out and didn't understand why God wasn't doing what he thought God should do. Habakkuk literally was mad and disappointed with God. Jesus on the cross said, why, God, are you forsaking me? So now I honestly believe that God is big enough to handle our doubts, may even embrace our questions. And so when we do doubt, instead of disconnecting and running from God, we can actually take our doubts, our questions, our hurts to God. And I believe we can grow stronger in our faith when we do. One of the first times that I really struggled with doubts as a Christian, believe it or not, was when I was in seminary. I had a New Testament professor that didn't have a high view of scripture, which I know sounds weird to a lot of people, but some seminary professors don't. And so he was real critical of God's word in the New Testament. So I started to have doubts. If the Bible's not true, if I can't trust it, then is everything else not true as well? And I kind of had a moment of panic. My pastor helped walk me through it and told me to keep hanging on to God. And then thankfully, I read this book called Theological Crossfire. It was a debate between um, Pinnock and Brown, two theologians. One was had a conservative high view of God's word, and the other one was more of a liberal view, and they debated. To me, the one who believed in God's word was so convincing that it was almost like God was there with me. You know, as a pastor, I'm always thankful for any great resource that strengthens people. And uh, Jesus Calling Daily Devotional is probably one of the top resources that I've had so many people talk about how it has completely revolutionized their spiritual life with God. The, the most common thing I hear is that it builds this real intimate faith in prayer. So many people find it difficult to pray to God. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to listen to God. And Jesus Calling takes people on a real journey to where Prayer is not some thing you do, it's, an, it's a conversation, it's intimate, it's highly relational, and uh, I'm so thankful for all the lives that have been changed by the work of God, His Spirit, through Jesus Calling. What's so meaningful to me today is that my trust in the authority of God's Word isn't just blind, it's one that was strengthened through a season of doubt. And that's why I really encourage people, don't see your doubts as something negative that God won't allow. The truth is, on the other side of it, you can have a stronger and a more intimate faith in God. CEO of IT Cosmetics, Jamie Kern Lima. I grew up watching Oprah in my living room every day. <laughs> and kind of from the time I was little, I always thought I would, I would interview other people for, and share their stories with the world. And I, when I found out I was adopted by surprise in my late twenties, I, I went on this five-year journey of trying to find my birth mom. And I had very little info on the paperwork and I didn't even know if it was actually factual or not, but I called thousands and thousands of women over a five-year period. And I would just get hung up on because everyone kind of thought it was a telemarketer. But then we eventually connected and we eventually met in person and, and now have a relationship. And the first thing that she ever gave me um, was a few photos of the family and Jesus Calling. 
which I already own. I've had it for years and I've, you know, I've been gifted it also. And then I have the app as well, but I love that Jesus calling for a lot of people is how they're able to connect and build their own faith. God showed up in so many ways in my life, but one of those ways actually uh, started on a day I was completely unexpecting it, which was our biggest breakthrough we've ever, ever had. And also one of the greatest lessons I've learned in life, which was after years of hearing no, I was at this trade show down to no money at all. And it's this big beauty expo in New York City. And there are 6,000 women there it's called Cosmetic Executive Women. So I signed us up for It Cosmetics. No one had heard of us, right? I signed us up and I'm like, I'm going to enter because I thought, you know, if you win one of their awards, then you'll get press, but also you might get picked up by retailers. And so I entered this beauty show. I'm standing there at this three foot table that you're not allowed to leave. And you're supposed to demonstrate your product as, as the thousands of people pass by. And I'm at this show and I see QVC as this huge booth in the background. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And I'm so focused on, on getting to that booth. Cause I was like, if I can meet somebody in person, maybe, maybe they'll give us a chance and I got away and snuck over to the QVC booth and I met a buyer and I poured my heart out to her I was like praying for the right words I felt sweat dripping down my body and I was just like freaking out because I had no money I didn't know how we were gonna stay alive the buyer was really nice she gave me her card and said we can have a meeting and I thanked her and I walked away and I didn't know if she meant it of course but I went back to my booth and I was continued demonstrating the product and all of a sudden about an hour later a woman comes up to me and she introduced herself and she said you know hello my name is miss lisa mason i'm a qvc show host and i want to let you know you know we were talking earlier and i tried your product and i just looked at her and it didn't register with me that we had spoken earlier because i was so distracted and she goes i just want to let you know i love your product so much i think our qvc gals at home really need this so i just went over to our head buyer and i told her that she needs to give you a chance and i looked at her and i literally started sobbing like right there tears started streaming down my face we got one shot we got a meeting at qvc we got one chance which meant we got this 10 minute window to go live on their air and you know they broadcast live on television to 100 million homes and we had this one shot to either hit their sales goal or not come back And now at the time, we were selling two to three orders a day on our website, barely keeping the lights on. And they let us know we had to, we had to sell over 6,000 units of our concealer in this 10 minute window to hit their goal or not come back. And so I flew to QVC a week early before our one chance. And I sat in the parking lot all alone in a rental car, praying, crying, asking God to take it from me because it felt so heavy. It came down to this moment where I just imagine like, who is it that's going to be watching me? Like if I'm going to go live in a hundred million homes and for some reason I kept imagining like a single mom folding laundry in Nebraska who had forgotten she's too busy to even remember she matters and that she's beautiful. And I was like, you know what? Like I would rather show real women, all ages, shapes, sizes, skin challenges, skin tones. And if the single mom in Nebraska is giving me two seconds of her time and she turns on her television, even if she buys nothing, I would rather have her see women who look like her and me calling them beautiful and meaning it than, than sell a ton of product and stand for nothing. And so I knew what I had to do. That one airing turned into five that year and 101 the next year. And eventually we built the biggest beauty brand in QVC's history. In my own journey, I think there's probably no way I could have gotten through the things like years of rejection to find my birth mom or years of rejection to, you know, build the big company or even just faith that I could eventually learn to hear what God says about me instead of my own self-doubt, my own inner critic says about me, right? I think that if I really tried to carry it all on my own, I don't think I could have done it. And I think going forward, I think this is the lifelong journey. I literally end my prayer by saying, and God, by the way, uh, if you could please prove me wrong, because I'm doubting that you exist, and I'd really appreciate it if you prove me wrong beyond a shadow of a doubt. In Jesus' name, amen. Like, I would literally end my prayers that way in my head. And he did, and he has, and he continues to do that. CNN anchor, Christy Paul.
I grew up in Bellevue, Ohio, which is a tiny little town smack between Toledo and Cleveland. And my dad was an attorney. My mom was a teacher. I have one brother who's six years younger than me. And I would not change a thing about where I grew up. I mean, it was rural Ohio. And I had some of the best friends. I dated a guy my sophomore year who had kind of a Jekyll and Hyde personality. He could be very good to me, but he cheated on me and he could be manipulative. And he did slap me across the face once in the middle of the hallway at school. And I remember that humiliation. And I said, I would never allow that to happen to me again. And then I went and married somebody who did even worse. And it was one of those things where you think, how did I get here? It started pretty early. I mean, there were things that happened, the yelling, the screaming, the punching of walls, the threats, before we even got married. And I, I can look back and go, why did I do that? I've learned to be forgiving of myself, but it took me a lot of years to get there. I was thousands of miles away from anybody that I knew. I knew nobody in Boise at the time. So when they talk about abusers, it was really the perfect storm because I came into the relationship out of some really heavy emotional stuff that was going on already. And now the only person I have is him. It's the isolation that they talk about. Abusers will try to isolate you. If something happened and I wanted to go home to see my parents and he looked at me and he said, I'm your family now. You don't need to be going home every time you're hurt about something. The night that got really bad, he was yelling at me and telling me that I didn't love him. He came home drunk and he threw his wedding ring at me and he said, I don't even want to be married to you. I'm sorry I ever did it. I'm leaving. And he threw me up against the wall and he put his hand around my throat and he said, I'm going to bash your head into this wall. And then he punched the wall right next to me, you know, close enough to my head that I could feel the, you know, swoosh of the fist and then heard obviously the crash of it into the wall and then he just stood there and looked at me and he didn't say anything but he looked at me as if he was trying to say I missed this time I won't miss again at some point I called a friend of mine in Boise and I told her what happened and I told her I was scared and I asked her if I could come to her house and she talked me out of it she was somebody that worked with both of us. She had the best of intentions, I know. I think she didn't know what to do. I don't blame her. People don't know what to do in those situations sometimes. So I stayed. And then we moved to Phoenix and I thought, okay, maybe this will be a new start. Maybe this will be okay. And the same kind of things kept happening. The manipulation, one night it, it all just blew up and he was screaming and he said he was going to leave and it was the first time I didn't try to stop him and then it really blew up and he did leave I went and sat in a church parking lot in Phoenix and I sobbed and I prayed and I said God I just don't know what you want me to do and Proverbs 3 5 through 6 trust in the Lord with all your heart Lean not on your own understanding. <sighs> I went, okay, you know, follow him and I will direct your paths. Give it to me, Christy. I think the hardest part of being in a relationship like that is determining whether you're going to stay or go. Once you make the decision, it's still hard, but it's easy because you know you're doing the right thing. And I say this about women a lot. My own observation of women and people that I've talked to who have been in that situation. We will do everything possible to fix it. 
We will do everything we can to remedy it, to put it back together, to glue everything, all of the pieces back that shattered. But once we're done, we're done. And I knew that I was done in that moment. I didn't know how it was going to work. I didn't know how I was going to leave safely. I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I was going to do it. And I did. Everything worked together. I went back to therapy. I felt humiliation and shame. I think that when you're in an abusive situation, the first time something happens, you accept the apology because we love them. We want to give them the benefit of the doubt. We've seen good in them. Then it happens a second time, a third time. And every time it happens after that, you realize, but I let it happen. I let it happen again and again and again. So the bricks of shame that sit on your shoulders just get heavier and heavier and heavier with every episode, every abusive episode that happens. You know, God wants us to be who he created us to be. And living in an abusive relationship is not going to create you to be the person you're supposed to be. I tell people all the time, you were not born to be abused. But God can take really horrible situations and make something really good out of them. Yes, it happened to you. It shouldn't have happened to you. But you also shouldn't let it affect the rest of your life because you don't deserve that. My mom gave me Jesus Calling several years ago. I was just in a horrible place. And I always say Jesus Calling transformed my life. I needed to hear God speak to me the way Sarah writes his words. It helped me remember my worth. And you think, oh, I've gone through this therapy and I've gotten through so much of it. It still pops up. They never go away. So Jesus Calling has probably been one of the most gifted books I have ever given to people. I just hand it out because it transformed my life. And I hope that it does for other people too, because I think it gives us a very different voice, a new voice, a very personal voice between our hearts and Jesus' words. And I just want everybody to know God is for you. We don't trust ourselves. Coming out of something like that, we don't trust ourselves to make a sound decision. But I learned that a healthy relationship will never require you to sacrifice your friends or your dreams or your dignity. We find the strength to be transparent and share our stories. We can help each other get through it. This is not about me. This is about God telling people, you are worth it. I am for you. Just trust me. Speaker, author, and humanitarian, Josh McDowell. I grew up in Union City, Michigan, and by the time I went to the university, I was very bitter, hurt, mad. My father was a town alcoholic growing up. And when you're from a small town, everybody knows it. And it seemed like, realistically, when he wasn't trying to kill my mother, I was trying to kill him. My one sister killed herself. My other brother sued my parents for everything they had. Another sister ran off to the army and never came back. And I was left as the baby to deal with it all. I carry a lot of baggage with me to this day, but coming to know Christ as Savior was a big step forward in it. When I got to university, I saw this small group of people, eight students, two professors, and their lives were different. They seemed to have a genuine love for each other and for people outside the group. I wanted it. So I made friends with them, and I said, what in the world changed your lives? Why are you so different than the other students, the professors on campus? And this one young lady just looked at me and said two words, Jesus Christ. And I said, oh, for God's sakes, don't give me that garbage. Well, ended up, they made me so mad, I set out to write a book against him called Evidence That Demands a Verdict and became a Christian. All the evidence in the world did not bring me to Christ. What it did was get my attention. It's like I was slamming the door on God, and he stuck his foot in the door with the evidence. 
Once I believed the Bible was true, once I believed that Christ was more than human and probably the Son of God, then and only then did I even consider the message of the Bible. As I started to read and study the Bible then, what brought me to Christ was the love of God. I have loved you with an everlasting love, with tender kindness I have drawn you. And the reason is, people at college, at Kellogg College and everything, they knew my background because I grew up about 23 miles from there. And they would, they would try to help me, like saying, well, Josh, there's a heavenly Father who loves you. There's a Father in heaven who loves you. That didn't bring me joy. That brought pain. Because emotionally and intellectually, I was not able to discern the difference between a heavenly Father and an earthly Father. I grew up believing fathers hurt. My dad hurt me. And yet I had many joyful times with my dad, but he hurt me. And it was that barrier that once I saw that if I was the only person in the world, Christ still would die for me. That's what brought me to Christ. Evidence got my attention. The love of God was the motivation. I have the, the little devotional book, Jesus Calling. My favorite of all of them is June 2nd, called Jesus Calling, and I love it. It says, do not be like Pharisees who multiplied regulations, creating their own form of godliness. And you talk about, while I transform your heart and mind, it just blew my mind how many people were truly interested in evidence and the truthfulness of their faith. Look at it this way. Today, people are really concerned asking questions. How do you know Jesus said that? How do you know he did that? If you think people are concerned today, think about the New Testament church. They were even more concerned about that. Why? Because they were dying for it. They were being martyred. And so they would say to John, John, how do you know Jesus said this? How do you know he did that? And in 1 John 1, listen to how he responds. He said, what our eyes have seen, what our ears, not somebody else, what our ears have heard, what our hands have handled, we declare unto you. They were personally, beyond any doubt, convinced on the resurrection of Christ because they were eyewitnesses for over 40 days after he was crucified and buried it says he rose from the dead and appeared to the apostles over a period of 40 days. Now get this, with many convincing proofs. And so they were convinced beyond their doubts. If we are going to pass our faith on to our children, there's several things we must do. One, we must be knowledgeable. We need to do our homework. You don't have to know everything. It's nothing wrong with saying to your son or anyone, I don't know, but follow it up with, I'll find out. You have to be knowledgeable. Second, you need a loving, intimate relationship with your children. Here's a phrase, truth without relationships leads to rejection. Truth is meant to be taught in the context of relationships. Like in the scriptures, it says, speak the truth in love. Love does not make it true. Love cultivates the ground so the truth will be received. Founder of The Giving Keys, Caitlin Crosby. I grew up in Los Angeles, born and raised, and my dad manages actors, and my mom was a model, an actress, graduated from Beverly Hills High School, the whole shebang, and I grew up going to youth group. My mother is a very compassionate and empathetic soul and really raised me in, to go to missions and always take our clothes and toys and everything to all these different nonprofits. And so she really kind of, yeah, taught me to care about people that weren't lucky enough to get a lot of the things that that we had. And, and I always grew up being really passionate about homelessness because it just felt so unjust that so many people growing up in LA had so much money and power and privilege and how it looked like a third world country. 
right in our backyard. And I was passing through New York on tour and the hotel room key was a, a big key and I thought it was really cool. So I put it around my necklace and started getting compliments on it. So one day I was leaving church on Hollywood Boulevard and they were playing this Invisible Children documentary and I left bawling my eyes out like, what else can I do to help people and change the world? And right then I saw this young couple, they were holding up a sign They were experiencing homelessness and their sign said, ugly, broke, and hungry. And I went up to them and I said, why does your sign say that? What's your story, et cetera? And fell in love with them. I canceled my plans that night and I ended up taking them to dinner. And I wasn't thinking about the giving keys at all. It just felt like a normal thing for me to do. So two hours into dinner, I said to the girl, I really like your necklace. And she said, oh, thanks. I like making jewelry. And I had my aha moment. And I said, oh, you're the missing link. Do you guys want to be my business partners? They're like, okay. So the next day I went to the locksmith and I bought all the engraving equipment and went to Pet Boys and bought hammers and started paying them to engrave the keys. They started saving up enough money to stay in a motel. When I met them, they lived in a cardboard box in a dumpster. Then little by little, they saved up and got their own apartment and then they couldn't keep up with the orders. So then we started partnering up with different transitional homes and nonprofits around the issue of homelessness. And so now we've been able to employ over 130 people that are trying to transition out of homelessness so far. So basically our model is the more products we sell, the more jobs we can create and the more people we can try and get off the streets. I think for me, faith has been kind of a challenging journey, to be honest, because I grew up so Christian and I'm really grateful for, you know, how that shaped me. But I went through my dark night of the soul years on and off. And I think whenever I have gone into those like dark pits of despair and questioning, you know, the point of all of this, I always come back to, I really believe that God answered my prayer, which was, God, give me your heart for people. Give me your heart for people. I want to feel. And I feel like he answered that question, that prayer through the giving keys, because I feel like the giving keys is such a perfect kind of example of his heart, which is, caring for people that are needing these words, whether you're a celebrity or you're experiencing homelessness. Everyone needs hope. Everyone needs love. Everyone needs strength. I think the model of the giving keys, just the fact that it exists makes me believe in God when I have doubted it. (laughs) Journalist, author, and podcaster, Paula Ferris. Just a couple of years ago, when I decided to pump the brakes at the height of my career, when I was anchoring Good Morning America weekends and co-hosting The View, and I really sensed God saying, I need you to slow down. And I was like, yeah, don't think so, God. You brought me here. This is my my gift, right? Isn't this the call on my life? Isn't this the one thing that I was born to do? I'm not going to walk away from that. And God allowed a series of events in my life. I I, I knew I had a peace in my spirit that I was supposed to to step back, but I was so scared about it. I was scared of what people would think if I if I pumped the brakes at the height of my career. And I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that, God. I'm I'm too scared. I was bound by what the world said instead of being bound by what God promised me. And I think God allows um, sometimes tragedy to happen in our life to get us to 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 slow down and focus on the opportunity. And within a matter of seven months, I I had five major events happen. I had a miscarriage with an emergency surgery. The day that I was had this I had a huge exclusive booked with Sean Spicer and I had to do that interview while I was miscarrying. And I had a concussion at work. It was a freak accident. Some kid threw an object at my head about 60 miles an hour right before I went live for Marine America and I had a concussion. I had to basically rest for three weeks, which was very hard for me. And the day I got cleared to go back to work from that concussion, I got in a head-on car crash. And then I had influenza, which turned into pneumonia. And that was within those five events within like less than seven months of my life. And I was like, okay, God, I knew that he was asking me to slow down and I refused to do it. And he had to slow me down. And he slowed me down through that series of events. And it was in that moment, I just had to say, okay, God, I know you want me to pump the brakes, 
I don't know why you're doing this, but I know that I need to get my life back. I need to get my priorities in order. I need to stop being addicted to my career and the spotlight and the accolade and the achievement. And it was in that space where once I decided to pump the brakes and walk away from Good Morning America Weekend and walk away from The View, God really revealed to me that I didn't know who I was outside of my job and that my eggs had been in this basket and my entire identity and purpose were consumed in this thing that could shift my job. Just so often we misplace our significance and things that shift, you know, our bank account, our relationship. And it was in that space where God really just gave me a word and allowed me to struggle but allowed me to discover what true purpose and true calling really mean that aren't tied to a thing. And I had to find out the parts of me that wouldn't change. And I had to find out who I was outside of what I did. I don't want to just have five, 10 minutes out of the day where I'm talking to God. I try to talk to God throughout my day. And, and I'm the type of person where I need encouragement throughout the day. So for me, it's, a daily conversation. God is always by my side. And so sometimes it's just like, if I'm in the moment, Jesus, give me strength to help me with this particular task right now. Listening to music, worshiping throughout the day. So for me, it's not a segment of my day. It's my whole day. I just try to be in constant contact. I try to be in constant conversation and tuned in to God throughout my day. And that's trying to be intentional about the types of things that I'm reading, the conversations that I'm having with people, listening for God to speak through people, through podcasts, through books, through sermons, through scriptures, making sure that the music that I'm listening to, for me, my spirit is very sensitive. Let's treat him like he's in the room. Let's treat him like he's right there. And so I think that's really been my approach. And I just try to stay connected in every aspect and really guard my heart and my spirit and my mind. Jesus is calling us throughout the day and in every moment. And sometimes we're too busy to see it and too busy to hear it. But it's up to us to make sure that our that we're looking for it. And once we're looking for it and we don't treat God like a 10 minute check-in every day, that we're treating our relationship as an ongoing 24 seven communication relationship, it really can just change our perspective and change the intimacy and the dynamic of our relationship with God. This is Jesus Calling for June 20th. I speak to you continually. My nature is to communicate, though not always in words. I fling glorious sunsets across the sky, day after day after day. I speak in the faces and voices of loved ones. I caress you with a gentle breeze that refreshes and delights you. I speak softly in the depths of your spirit where I have taken up residence. You can find me in each moment when you have eyes that see and ears that hear. Ask my spirit to sharpen your spiritual eyesight and hearing. I rejoice each time you discover my presence. Practice looking and listening for me during quiet intervals. Gradually, you will find me in more and more of your moments. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me above all else. That's so good. That is so good. And it really gets at the heart of asking the spirit to sharpen right there. Ask the spirit to sharpen your spiritual eyesight and your hearing so that you're looking for God. You're looking for Jesus calling you throughout the day. And once you ask the spirit, to, to, to come into your life and, and, and to allow you to see things in a new way, you will. And it'll transform your relationship with God. It'll transform your, your belief in God. It'll transform the way that you see God. And you'll start seeing Him in the sunsets across the sky. You'll start to hear Him in the voices of loved ones and in the faces of loved ones. And you'll feel Him in that gentle breeze and you'll hear him speaking softly in the depths of your spirit. But it's up to us to ask the spirit to sharpen our eyesight so that those scales can fall off, so that we can see things fully and hear things fully and feel God fully. Pastor Dominic Dunn. So 
Gallup poll. They put out this study and they found that church attendance in America is actually at an all-time low. And then added to that, according to another survey, this was Pew, they said the number of Americans who are experiencing doubts about God has actually increased 15% in the last 10 years. And that two-thirds of people who identify as Christian, they admit to struggling with doubt. So I think we just find ourselves in this time where people are hungering and thirsting for a more authentic form of faith. And then we're also confronted with questions and doubts and uncertainties. I think of the author James K.A. Smith, he said, we don't believe instead of doubting, we believe while doubting. We are all Thomas now. And, and I think that's true just of, of this time in which we live that many of us can identify and relate to a guy like Doubting Thomas. And we, we want a deeper form of faith, but we also don't know what to do with our struggles and, and our questions. And sadly, in Christian subculture, there wasn't much room for doubts. So I kind of grew up in this context thinking, I've got these questions, I, I have these uncertainties, I don't know what to do with them because what I'm told every week is you just got to have faith. You just got to have faith. And you really suppress your doubts. You push down the questions with more songs and sermons and affirmations of faith. And so I think rather than suppressing our doubts, we need to honestly engage with them. I would actually argue that doubt leads to questions. If you begin to unpack the word doubt, actually, it comes from this Latin word dubitare, which means two. So when you're doubting, you're literally in two different minds. Or think of what the book of James says, the person who doubts is like the person who's kind of tossed back and forth on the waves of the sea. And I think that's more descriptive rather than a judgmental comment about those who doubt. It does feel like that. You're, you're in this place of being thrown back and forth. You're in two minds. You're torn between two perspectives. And that's where questions are born because you're wondering which one is true, which way should I go? I think it takes like wisdom to learn how to live in the tension of an unresolved faith. And that's the key, isn't it? Because our faith is unresolved. We see through a glass dimly, Paul said. So questions are part of the package. In fact, I would actually argue that questions, God designed it in such a way that questions are born and that questions can lead us into a deeper, richer, more meaningful relationship with God. So for many people, their theology of doubt begins in Genesis 3. But what I do in the book is actually say, no, let's back up a little bit. What if our theology of doubt and questions should begin in Genesis 1? And, and what I mean by that is Genesis 3, where most people view doubt, is, okay, you have Adam and Eve, they're in a garden, they're tempted, and the serpent uses questions as a way to derail their relationship with God and bring sin into the world. And that's true. I mean, Satan did use doubt in a very destructive way. Doubt can be destructive if it's not dealt with and reacted to in a healthy way. So many people, that's where their, their theology of doubt begins. They think, okay, look, doubt is always of the devil. Questions are always bad. So let's just suppress them and let's just pretend everything's okay. But I actually argue in chapter one, no, we should go back to Genesis 1, because what we see there is an infinite God who creates a finite world. We see a God who is, has endless power and resources and knowledge, and yet he creates, and just by the act of creating, he's going to create something lesser than himself. He's not duplicating himself. He's making something less than himself, which means just by definition, the world in which we live is going to have boundaries and limitations. We're going to have boundaries and limitations. So he places the first humans in a garden which had boundaries and limitations. They had limitations on their time limitations in their knowledge. There's a lot of uncertainty. Even the animals needed to be named, right? And at the same time, in a world of boundaries and limitations and unresolved mystery, he creates male and female deeply curious, deeply inquisitive. And there were things they wanted to discover. I think if we start there in Genesis 1, it reshapes how we view doubt. It reshapes our theology of questions. Because then we realize, oh, God made the world in which doubt and questions could exist, and actually they can be the very catalyst that pushes us closer to Him. I actually think that some of the most raw and passionate expressions of doubt ever written are in the book of Psalms. I mean, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or how long, O oh Lord? Or why do the nations rage? Like These deep and even unsettling questions are, are found in Psalms. And here, here's what I love. It's not just the content of the words, but that God 
gave space for it. <laughs> God didn't edit out the doubtful Psalms. He didn't say, you know what, forget Psalm 22. <laughs> right? That's not going to be in the Word. He allowed it space, which I think is God's way of saying, look, there is room to be honest. In fact, I want you to be honest. And in those times where you're hurting and questioning and you're asking why, and you're going through some tragedy or crisis, or it seems like God is silent, I want you to bring those things to me. I want you to know that I care for you. I want you to know that I'm standing with you and beside you. And and just tell me what, what it is you're experiencing. Come to me when you're weary and heavy laden, and I will find you rest. The Bible is jam-packed with stories and examples and characters like that, women and men who had doubts and uncertainties. And Jesus, he gave them space. I mean, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, and he sends them out into the world. And you have this amazing line. It says, some worshiped and some doubted. <laughs> and if I were Jesus, I would divide the worshipers from the doubters. I'd like, okay, worshipers, you're part of this thing. You know, doubters go home. But he doesn't. He, he sends out both the worshipers and the doubters. They were vital to the revolution that Jesus began that literally turned the world upside down. So I, I would say you're not alone. And not only that, um, you're actually right where you need to be because God is going to use this season in your life to grow your faith. Don't give up on your faith. Don't give up pursuing truth. Don't give up seeking and searching for the answers and for God. He will meet you on the other side. And I think one way, one practical way that we can move through our doubts is actually through study, through listening to a good podcast or reading Jesus Calling or tearing into a good commentary or sitting down with, with a teacher, a professor, or a pastor, or someone who's further on in their spiritual walk. So I think everyone's heard about Jesus Calling, and it has impacted so many lives, including my own. I just find it deeply, deeply refreshing. So I pastor this church in Portland. There are so many people who have been shaped and inspired through its words as well, because it helps you slow down. It helps you just be in the moment and in a posture of receiving from the Lord. That's what I love about it, because it's impossible to read Jesus Calling without asking the question, God, what are you saying to me today? <laughs> what, is, what is your heart for me today? And just bathing yourself in that day after day after day actually puts you in a place of receiving and I think trains the soul to go through life in a posture of receiving. Here's a line from Jesus Calling, February 29th. I just, I love these words. I think it just lines up with so much of what we're talking about. It says, you are on the right path. Listen to me more and less to your doubts. And leading you along the way I designed just for you. Therefore, it is a lonely way, humanly speaking. But I go before you as well as alongside you. So you are never alone. Do not expect anyone to understand fully my ways with you any more than you can comprehend my dealings with others. I'm revealing to you the path of life day by day and moment by moment. As I said to my disciple Peter, so I repeat to you, follow me. I love that, especially those words, follow me, because I think it captures what the journey of faith looks like, that when Jesus invites us to, to come after him, it's following, it necessitates movement and motion and change and travel and adventure. And so that means there's going to be seasons in our life where we're sensing him and his presence is real, closer than our next breath. And there's going to be other times where we wonder where he is. But it's in times like that, the journey, that he's taking us deeper and deeper into himself. You know, the word question actually comes from the root word quest. And that's what we're on. We're on a quest. We're pursuing God and he's with us through it all, the highs and lows, the ebbs and flows of faith. And even if it feels like our faith fails, the good news is he never will. Thank you for listening to this special bonus episode of the Jesus Calling Podcast. Be sure and follow the Jesus Calling Podcast so you can hear the full stories from each of these guests and also make sure you get these special bonus episodes each month. For more information on Jesus Calling and Sarah Young, please visit JesusCalling.com or visit us on our social media channels on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.